Greetings. Um, Right now, I'm honestly a bit in shock because I think Rachel's keynote got started a few minutes late. And so to see this room filling up while I'm pretty sure she's still speaking is incredibly, incredibly flattering to me. Um, Thank you so much for being here. My name is Caroline Wong, and I couldn't be more thrilled to be here today. This morning, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. And my hope is that my story might inspire you to share yours. I started my information security career more than a decade ago, leading security teams at eBay and Zynga. Since then, I've led a global product management team at Symantec, been a management consultant at Sigital, and I'm currently the chief security strategist for a pen test as a service company called Cobalt.io, based out of San Francisco. I've been named by the Executive Women's Forum as a woman of influence in the one to watch category. I've published a best-selling textbook with McGraw-Hill on the topic of security metrics. I've been featured by SC Magazine as an influencer in their issue on women in IT security and Cloud Now has chosen me as one of their top 10 women in cloud. I'm on the advisory councils for RSA Conference. The platform called Wistic. I'm publishing six LinkedIn learning courses on the OWASP top 10, and I host a podcast called Humans of InfoSec. This is my professional story, and it's my public one. My personal story looks a little bit different. In 2012, I married the wrong person, and in 2013, I got divorced. For years, I've struggled with anxiety, depression, and alcoholism. In 2014, my father was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, In 2015, my daughter was born, and my father passed away one week later. You might be thinking to yourself, Caroline, B-Sides might not be the best place for you to be sharing this information. Maybe you should see a therapist. I do, (laughs) and I have been for nine years. So why am I sharing this with you? It's because our industry has a burnout problem. We have a massive talent shortage. And for as long as that's the case, it is absolutely critical that the professionals in our industry take care of themselves. Because the world needs us. In in, in 2012, Google conducted a study to try and figure out how to build the perfect team. They examined everything from how frequently people eat together to common traits between the best managers. They analyzed 180 teams throughout the company, and they also reviewed half a century's worth of academic studies on how teams work. Surprisingly, the data did not seem to show that any specific mix of personality types, skills, or backgrounds made any significant difference. It turns out that what does matter is something called psychological safety, a sense of confidence that the team will not embarrass, reject, or punish someone for speaking up. Because I'm a security person, I think about this like a software application that's never been tested for security issues. The issues are there, but they're hidden until someone intentionally tries to find them or they explode unexpectedly during an incident. Security teams are always going to have their issues, regardless of whether people talk about them or not. Team members that trust each other are more likely to share information so that issues come to the surface and can be managed efficiently and proactively. If I'm gonna take a half day off work to celebrate my daughter's birthday, 
it helps for me just to say so. That way, my team knows where I am, and we can all plan accordingly. It's much worse if I don't tell anyone, and then that morning I just pretend to be sick, and I don't show up in the office. The latest global information security workforce study by ISC Squared reports that the world could use almost 3 million more cybersecurity professionals. An ISSA study found that 70% of cybersecurity professionals feel impacted by the talent shortage, resulting in an increased workload and a situation where teams spend more of their time fighting fires than focusing on training, planning, and strategy. Does that sound familiar? It's also the perfect setup for burnout. Burnout is described as a state of chronic stress that leads to physical and emotional exhaustion, cynicism and detachment, and feelings of ineffectiveness and lack of accomplishment. Does that sound familiar? Severe burnout means that you can no longer function effectively on a personal or professional level. The tricky thing is that burnout doesn't happen overnight. It sort of creeps in gradually in this sneaky way that fools us into thinking that living in a state of constant stress is normal and acceptable. Living in a state of constant stress is not normal and it should not be acceptable. What we're capable of bringing to the table as healthy, happy, functioning professionals is simply too valuable to lose due to a lack of team trust or to burnout. Early in my career, I used to put up with being treated poorly because I thought it was normal. And I used to treat myself poorly too. I don't do that anymore. Self-care starts with believing that you deserve it. I want to talk to you about a concept called cognitive behavioral therapy. The basic idea is that thoughts, emotions, and behaviors are all connected, and that you have the power to change, or at least influence, one by changing the other. To do it, you identify a negative thought process, and you try to change it into a positive one. It can be much easier said than done, because our negative thought processes are often so deep-seated in our brains that we don't even realize they're there. I'll give you a couple of examples. My parents are immigrants, and they raised me to be able to take care of myself and to have as many choices in life as possible. Growing up, doing well in school was a really big deal. As a child and teenager, I did well in school, and that felt really good. But when I started the electrical engineering and computer sciences program at UC Berkeley, all of a sudden that part of my identity changed. It took me decades to develop the core belief that I'm smart and I work hard. Unfortunately, over time, I also began to develop a few associated core beliefs that are quite negative and, de and self-defeating. Number one, my worth comes from my success in school and work. Number two, if I am not constantly exceeding expectations, then I am a failure. And number three, I need to work harder. And unless I'm succeeding, I don't deserve to be treated well. Over the past 10 years or so, I've worked hard to try and replace these negative belief processes in my brain with positive ones. I accept myself as I am right now. I know and approve of myself. I embrace balance. I allow myself to play and to enjoy life. I went through this quickly at the beginning. 2015 was a really crazy year for me. My father was fighting a terminal illness and I was pregnant for the first time. And it was a pregnancy that had complications. 
I began to, for a variety of different reasons, I also, I'm sort of like a natural warrior. Worrier, not warrior, although, you know, I'm a warrior too. But I'm a worrier, and I think that this industry attracts worriers. Um, so worrying can be, can be destructive. Um, and I wanna also share with you some cognitive behavioral therapy uh, that I work on personally with regards to worrying about things. So my negative thought process that's related to anxiety says that bad things happen and also that the worst case scenario will happen to me. I won't be prepared and I have no control over my life. This is not a fun way to live and I have lived like this for a very, very long time. I'm working on it and, and it's getting better but it's this thing that takes a while. So what can I change my negative thought processes about worrying and anxiety to? I can tell myself that things happen. And in fact, good things happen just as often as bad things happen. And since I'm the one who gets to choose what I think, it's pretty convenient if I believe that good things are actually more likely than bad things to happen. I've talked with my therapist about when I worry about something or when I have like this daydream nightmare of something horrific happening, I can, I can change it and I can instead try and think about something that I'm grateful for. There's this idea that the mind can only hold one thought at a time. And if I can think about something I'm grateful for instead of something I'm worried about, that can actually feel a lot better. It's much easier said than done. Another thing, and I grew up going to Catholic school, so I would like walk around the church and there were these plaques that had the serenity prayer. And while I consider myself to be a recovering Roman Catholic, and I don't actually subscribe to that particular formal religion, I do think there's a lot to be said for recognizing in life that there are things you can control and there are things you can't control. And there's sort of no point to worrying about the things you can't control, but to the extent that you can recognize and actually do something about what you can control, you can actually, I believe you can change your life. So my negative cognition here was, you know, bad things are gonna happen and I won't be prepared. My positive thought process that I'm working on and that sometimes I believe, right now I believe it, is that if stuff happens and it will, I actually trust my future self to be able to handle it. I know that I can handle all sorts of stuff and I trust my future self to be able to handle it. My current self doesn't have to worry about something that's not happening right now. Okay, so we're switching topics. We're back to the information security talent gap. For those of us that have and are developing skills in information security, there's this beautiful silver lining to the talent gap, and that's we have choices. So in 2016, my daughter was a year old. It was becoming apparent to me that my lifestyle as a traveling management consultant needed to change. I began to search for a local job, and I spoke with 15 different organizations about various information security roles. 15 is a lot of opportunities. That's a tremendously fortunate position to be in. For me, one of the coolest things about becoming a mom is that my sense of what I want and what really matters to me has become clear. So during my job search in 2016, the number one criteria that I looked for was working with people that I like and respect, who like and respect me. And it's fascinating to me that that is something that I have to like seek out, that I can't just sort of take for granted. But I have had experiences with toxic colleagues and in toxic work environments, and I don't want that anymore. 
it turns out that being surrounded by people that I trust actually makes my life a lot better. Every single day is better when I can go to work and look forward to seeing my team. My number two criteria this time around during my most recent job search was the ability to have a big impact. And that's why for the first time in my career, I decided to join a startup. And it has been very awesome. I'm here to ask and encourage you to take care of yourself. And I want to talk to you about some ideas that I have about how to do that. I think it's really important to try and get to know yourself. We live in this world where there's so much stimuli, stimuluses, stimuli. There's so much stimuli. There's so much going on. There are a million things asking us for our attention. We can become experts in things that are outside of ourselves. It's a different type of effort to try and become an expert about yourself. And I would argue that it's actually super duper important. So get to know yourself. How do you do that? Pay attention to how you feel. Which again, for some of us is easier said than done. I literally remember sitting in my therapist's office about a decade ago and she said to me, Caroline, how do you feel? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> like I can tell you intellectually what I'm thinking and I can tell you, <clears throat> I can tell you about the sensations in my body. Like I have a headache, I'm hungover, but I can't tell you how I feel. So I had to really, I had to practice. So if you're not good at figuring out how you feel, that's okay. You can try uh, and over time, it's actually something you can learn. So I want to talk about um, managing your energy because here's sort of a practical way, practical way to use paying attention to how you feel. When you're doing something, well, let me just read this part actually. Okay, there's a lot of techniques and strategies about how to manage one's time, but what about your energy? There's only 24 hours in a day, but given your energy level, you can either feel completely depleted and like you have nothing left to give, or you can feel inspired, like your tank is full and you can accomplish anything. So next time you're doing something, anything, like right now, you can kind of check in with yourself and say like, does this make me feel good or does this make me feel not so good? And if it makes you feel good, do some more of it. And if it makes you feel not so good, figure out a way to do less. Find out what gives you energy and what takes it away from you and choose your activities accordingly. Okay, so this next section, here are a few things that I do to take care of my mind. Meditation, which if you haven't meditated before can also seem intimidating. Luckily, there are smartphone apps to help you with this. Um, Calm, Headspace, Spotify. you just like put in some headphones and press a button and then you just like listen. Uh, and it can be a really nice way to create some space in a very frantic day. Journaling, uh, another thing that is kind of like easier said than done because you have to, like any of these things, carve out time to do it. And you don't have to carve out like a ton of time. One of the most useful times I ever journaled was uh, a time when I was feeling deeply depressed. And what I did was I was like, I feel super depressed and I don't know why. This is really confusing. Uh, and so what I did was I put a notebook next to my bed. And in the morning, the first thing I did when I woke up, even before I grabbed my phone, even before I went to use the restroom, I would grab the notebook and I would just write stream of consciousness like a page. Uh, there's a book, the title that I can't think of right now, um, that tells you you should write like three pages. I wrote like a page and I did this for like a month. And the point is actually not even to go back and read your journal, but when you're in that mode of like waking up, you're sort of going from 
like not conscious to conscious. And there's this way in which like your subconscious knows stuff about you that your conscious doesn't. And so I was able to kind of capture some things. And for me, that particular exercise uh, led me to realize that I sort of was not with the right person. And so I decided to divorce my husband. It was the best, the best decision I've ever made. Um, I'm in therapy. I'm medicated. I have life insurance. So as a mom, something that helps me tremendously with addressing my anxiety is to have insurance. Um, that's really cool. Taking vacation or taking time off um, and doing art. I think there's something really beautiful about doing something that's like not productive. Um, and I think art uh, and I think pets are really good. So we've got 10 minutes left. It's almost time for q and I'm going to go through these next couple a little more quickly. Take care of your body. Try and get some sleep. Try and eat some stuff that's good for you. Cooking can feel really nice. There's nothing like baking cookies. Um, move your body and care. So <laughs> in my slide, I had care. And then in parentheses, I had feet, comma, allergies. And I was like, I'm just going to talk to that part. Um, so what that means is I've got this condition where I have flat feet. And so if I wear normal shoes, and I just go throughout my day, even if, or, or if I'm barefoot in my house, my feet like really hurt. It's called plantar fasciitis, it sucks. So now I wear like proper shoes and it makes my life so much better. And I also have uh, dust, and al uh, dust and like pollen allergies. So I use a neti pot and I, and I use a nasal spray and it just makes, it makes life better. I'm parenting myself. Uh, side note, there's this group called ACA. It's kind of like AA, but it's something slightly different. And the whole idea is to be like a really good parent to yourself. Uh, and life can be better. So take care of your spirit. It's nice to surround yourself with people that respect and like you and that you like and respect. That feels really good. It's nice to work on things that make you feel like you have impact. It's nice to hang out with friends and family and pets. Uh, it's nice to have groups of people around you that you feel like you can rely upon. Uh, it's nice to think about things that you're grateful for. Uh, and it's nice to have rituals, whether that's you know, making a cup of espresso in the morning. Okay, key takeaways, and then we're then gonna do q and I'm going to leave you today with three key takeaways. Be committed to your work and learn everything you can. Make sure you really understand whatever problem you're trying to solve and then apply your talents and work hard. Number two, be opportunistic. If your job sucks, find a better one. Seek and leverage mentors who can see your potential and advise you beyond your own experience. And number three, most importantly, take care of yourself. You will deliver your highest quality work when your heart, mind, and body are well. Thank you. And now it's time for Q&A. And you're supposed to use this Slido thing. And I don't know how I'm supposed to use Slido. I'm just gonna stand here and if there are questions, I will respond to them. So oh, um, I have a microphone as well. So if the audience has any questions, I can run over and hand you the mic. So I believe we have our first question down here. And then our second one will be up there. So I'll be right over. Kelly. Uh, hi, I'm Kelly. Uh, thank you for sharing this. Uh, I, I wanted to know how honest and open are you with about with this stuff about your team with your team uh, at work and in the workplace? I'm super honest about it with my team. And I think that it creates a nice environment. Um, I often talk about my mental illness and my personal growth uh, with my team at work. Um, you know, right now I think this is being recorded and maybe it'll go up on YouTube and then the whole world can kind of find out. So there's no, there's no point really to being secretive about it. I've developed a level of comfort talking about it. I wasn't always this comfortable. The first time I presented this talk, I was like, 
super awkward and vulnerable and shaky. Uh, and I don't think there's any value to sharing stuff before you're ready to. There's all sorts of ways to share it in, um, in degrees, right? You can write stuff down, put it in a journal, just with yourself. I write emails to my therapist that nobody else reads except for her. It's amazing. Sometimes I copy my best friend. Sometimes I copy my sister, you know? Um, there's all sorts of messed up stuff that has to do with me that I didn't talk about today, but this is the stuff that I've developed a level of comfort with talking about, and my team knows me. I used to have this thing where it was like, oh, I've got this like professional self. I even like a, had like a professional wardrobe, and then I had like this personal self, and they were two different people, and now it's just, it's just easy to just be one me. Hi, uh, my name is Susan Pediacle. I um, appreciate your talk today, and thank you so much for. I'm up here. Sorry. Hi. Oh, I see. You. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Cool. Yeah, there's a spotlight. No, I just like sorry. to try and you know look at people. Yeah, of course. Um, not to blind you. Uh, so I actually am part of a group called Mental Health Hackers, and so um, thank you so much for bringing this talk to Beside San Francisco and uh, shining some light on it. Um, if anybody else wants more information aside from like what Carolyn talked about and would like to connect. Um, I'm one of the board members and I would love to spread that message there too. We're trying to be at as many conferences as possible, create wellness vill villages so people don't feel so overwhelmed, so people don't feel alone, imposter syndrome, all of those kind of things that um, people feel. So um, mental health hackers, uh, we're on the web and I have stickers if anybody wants them too. So thank you. <laughs> I would love a sticker. Mental health hackers, thank you so much. What a wonderful presence. Um, hi, I'm Ava. I'm curious how much, like what percentage, if you put a number to it, you think that um, maintaining a professionally separate identity contributed to your stress and your burnout or what you're talking about? Yeah, I think, I think that for me, actually, the, the like professional Caroline and then the personal Caroline and that separation, I think for me that was actually a symptom, not a cause. Um, so for me, I sort of had these goals and these values and, um, you know, at work it was like, okay, I, I want people to perceive me in a certain way and so I'm going to highlight those parts of myself. Um, and then my personal life, you know, whatever. Um, and, and these days, these days it's just one and the same and I, and I think it's less that I chose it as a thing to work on, and more of, again, a symptom of my continued self-growth. Uh, it's, it's just honestly for me a recognition that, for me it's easier, and I've taken baby steps. You know, the first time I met with a coworker and I said, hey, you know, such and such about me is going on, and that person was receptive and supportive and caring and not taunting, uh, it was cool. You know, when I recognized that there was a way where I could actually connect with people. Um, and then what I have found out is that for any given struggle that I've experienced that I confide in someone that I trust, uh, I find out actually lots of other people struggle with this stuff too. And that helps me feel a lot less alone. Hi, I'm Sarah. Hello. As somebody else who also married someone and realized it was the wrong person, did you find, I know this is a super specific question, um, did you find that at work the people were supportive or did you sort of cover that up when it was going on? Because I found that one quite tricky in the workplace. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I think for me, you know, part of my, at the time, work persona, when I was, for example, engaged and married, um, was sort of this like happy-go-lucky, you know, bride. Um, and then all of a sudden that like wasn't me anymore. Um, and I think for me at work, you know, people would make assumptions because they were like, oh, you know, you and your guy and I was like oh not really the guy anymore you know and then and and for me it's sort of like if it's somebody that I trust at work then I'll sort of like have a little side conversation with them 
And if it's somebody that I don't know very well, then frankly, it's none of their business. And what we have to do at work is what we have to do at work. Whatever the task is at hand, whatever the project is at hand, you know, my personal life doesn't, like, isn't anyone's business. Like, I'm here encouraging people to share, but also very much to the extent that you are comfortable with. Um, you know, you may be a private person, in which case, like, it's totally cool to be like, you know what? I'm a really private person, and I, I don't really feel like, talk, like talking about that right now. That's like a totally, like, that's an awesome thing to do for yourself. Hello, um, I'm Mitchell. Um, thank you for the talk, it was very helpful. Uh, how would you go about disassociating, feeling like your job is your personality, rather than trying to separate the two? Yeah, so this is a really interesting thing particularly in the United States, where there's sort of like this like, work hard, make money, buy stuff culture. Um, I think the trick is to do other stuff. And I think the trick is to, you know, sometimes that's easier said than done too, right? Where do you find time to do other stuff? Like, but you, you can, you can like during a meeting like draw a picture on your notebook that doesn't have to do with work. You know, you can draw a picture of a dog. And you're like, "Okay, I'm I'm a person who draws dogs." You know, and that'll literally take like 5 minutes. You know, you can you can on your commute listen to whatever music you love. And depending on where you're at and your comfort level with it, you can like scream at the top of your lungs. You know, you could take a five minute bath and then you're like a person who takes baths. Um, so I think, the, I think the trick is like to recognize that in a day, like a lot of what we do has to do with our work, but there's stuff that doesn't have to do with our work too. Um, like I'm wearing hiking boots to that whole shoe thing that I was talking about and I was kind of stressed out about it. I was like, oh, maybe I should wear like more professional looking shoes. And then I was like, you know what? These shoes are really comfortable and I'm pretty sure no one actually cares what shoes I'm wearing. So I'm like, I'm a person that wears hiking boots to a professional conference. Howdy, Alan here. Um, have you struggled with uh, imposter syndrome? It was mentioned before up there. I was just curious what your take on that was. Yeah, so, so my first information security job was on the eBay information security team. I will briefly tell you, because I think I have like maybe a few more minutes before the next talk is gonna happen. Um, I was in college. I'm studying electrical engineering and computer science. It is my junior year, and I think, okay, I'm supposed to get an internship. So I look for an internship. I apply to like 40 or 50 different jobs. I get this internship at eBay. And I graduate, and I say to my hiring manager for the internship, hey, uh, can you hire me? Because I would really like to work for your team full time. And he says to me, we would love to hire you, but we have a hiring freeze in IT. However, there is this entry level position in information security, you should apply to it. And I literally said, I don't know anything about information security. And he said, that's okay. You know, they're looking for a new college grad to train. You know, the expectation is not that you've been doing this for a long time. And so I start this job, and my job is to be in charge of the 50-page information security policy. I'm supposed to be the subject matter expert. And people in the business come to me and they say, hey, why do we have to follow these information security rules? And I'm supposed to like, you know, tell them why. Um, so luckily for me, I type really fast. And so I'm able to have a meeting, type really fast. If I don't understand everything that's going on, I write it down. And then I go and talk to one of the team's managers, one of my team's managers, and I say like, hey, this is what's going on. Can you teach me about it? And then I go back and I say, okay, here's, here's what you need to know. So that for me was a very, difficult place to be in because I was sort of in this role where my job was to provide information about this this subject matter that I was I was just learning about. All right.
Great. I want to just um, go ahead and end the discussion right here. But Carolyn will be here all day at B Sides. So if you have more questions about her talk, self care, uh, please come by and meet Carolyn. She's wonderful. Uh, we will be taking a quick five minute break so we can switch over to our next talk by Kelly Robinson. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>